Welcome to this second video in this series about digital twins. In the first video, we set a number of goals for a digital twin of a mid-size office copy machine. In contrast with traditional approaches, it should have form, mass, and position within the building. In the second video, we focus on the creation of our digital twin. It will, as much as possible, be a thermophysical equal to other elements within the thermal zone. It will, as much as possible, interact dynamically with other elements in the thermal zone. Hopefully it will present the thermal zone with flows of hot air and warm surfaces similar to those observed in testing. It will also hopefully exhibit the temporal responses to different workloads, as well as a degree of inertia between the electrical draws and their expression at the machine facade. And it would be great if making all this happen doesn't involve an awful lot of mucking around in the source code. What pattern might we follow? Well, we have an explicit model of a room thermostat, which has a case, circuit board, and a tiny surface that acts as the sensor. It's an almost literal expression of the physical device, which captures most of the heat flow paths within the sensor and the room. It's sensitive to transient sun patches, as well as to the inertia of the wall that it's actually mounted on. A photocopy machine, on the other hand, is one or two orders of magnitude more complex geometrically and thermophysically. To be almost literal, that would be a big ask. Perhaps a bit of abstraction is warranted. Abstraction's all about choices. What do we include? What do we exclude? Normal rules of model abstraction argue for a rough approximation of the facade of the machine, its mass, and volume. Given that this is a prototype, let's follow the dictum. Delay model detail until we understand it well enough to know that we need more detail. On the left is a copy machine sketch from the first video. On the right is our delayed detail model. Our initial prototype captures the form of the facade with a minimum number of surfaces. This limits the complexity of the surfaces within the parent room. And because we might also wish to carry out visual assessments, let's decorate the model with visual entities such as the paper sorting trays on the left, Let's put a lid on the scanner and add some control buttons. In terms of composition, much of the facade is composed of molded plastic parts with metal inserts. The internal composition is also a mix of materials. As a facade, this is seriously complex. A literal model would include scores of thermal bridges as well, but let's not go there. This physical device is seriously opaque. If you really want it to be literal and accurate, you would do a physical teardown, if not a tear apart. If you've got that kind of budget, please do that. But for this video, we're gonna make some assumptions. The facade is a mix of four millimeter ABS and a hollow ABS section with some steel plates at the grills. Internally, there are multiple steel plates back to back. This model totals up to 106 kilograms, which allows for paper and toner. The manufacturer's list weight of the copy machine is 101 kilograms. Having come up with our list of materials, we attribute the very surfaces of the machine to reflect these assumed constructions. Next, well, we're injecting heat into the copy machine of the thermal zone. To ensure that the internal mass gets its fair share of the heat injection, we're going to set some high heat transfer coefficients at the steel plates. In terms of the electrical properties, uh, the plate rating is an instantaneous worst case. Measurements indicate a broad range with rare peaks near 1200 watts and during printing, usually around 900 watts, but the standby ranges between 25 watts and 300 watts. 
Of course, an electrical engineer would note that the mix of motors and resistance heating elements is going to alter the real and reactive mix of the plug demands. But let's pin that for a later iteration when we might bring in the power solver into the mix. The machine impacts the room by way of exhaust air as well as elevated surface temperatures. When the model was first set up in 2017, I recorded a few thermographic images. It informed the initial design of the digital twin. For this video, I used a newer generation of thermographic camera and recorded conditions as a print run progressed. Reviewing this video, the left axis shows the current range of temperatures within the scene. There are also two highlights that dance around showing the warmest and coldest spot currently in the scene. As the video plays out, we see that the machine has regions at vastly different temperatures. Near the print engine, along the paper path, and the paper trays. We get glimpses that the exhaust air is in the order of 45 to 60 degrees C. The grill's at roughly 40 degrees in some cases. The case is also 40 degrees. But away from the heat sources, the case is slightly above ambient. Let's call it 25 to 28 degrees. What temporal resolution should we aim for? The rapid fluctuations suggest that we need to set a short time step for the thermal, flow, and electrical solvers. A one minute time step might be a good place to start. Having created our initial digital twin, we need a context to test it within. The most straightforward is to replicate what was actually monitored. A copy room is adjacent to an open office space, which is usually an open door. There's glass-fronted offices to the left and right. The room also hosts a large format plotter and supplies and tables. Above the offices and print rooms is a ceiling void, and there's a minimally functioning extract grill in the ceiling. One of the major heat flow paths is air exchange between the room and the photocopy machine. Observations indicated that the exhaust fan kicks on briefly during standby at roughly 40 degrees C. Observations indicated heat from the print room dispersing into adjacent office spaces. So the digital twin uses an airflow network to track airflows between the rooms as well as between the machine and the print room. The latter is ideally controlled by way of a fan switch set at 40 degrees as an initial guess. Use patterns for the machine are simply imposed the monitored electrical demands. ESP has a temporal facility which can take measured data and use that to set the electrical power going into the copy machine. A typical two-day period indicates a number of patterns. Especially note that the values are substantially less than the backplate rating and there are quite a few hours when the standby state is well above what we would normally assume for a sleep state. What set of performance indicators do we need to capture in order to gain trust in our model? Electrical demands are imposed. However, case temperatures and the sensible heat from the exhaust, we want to track those to see if they roughly follow the observations. That would be a powerful deliverable to the assessments and they could use existing reporting facilities. So let's run a short assessment and see what happens. If we plot temperatures in the room and in the machine, along with heat injections into the machine, we see that the room temperature rises roughly six degrees during the day, falls back a bit at night. The machine temperatures all over the place. If we guessed 50 degrees C as an average, well, a clock stopped is correct two times a day. If we look inside the machine, the heat injection translates to higher air temperatures as expected, and they occasionally approach 75 degrees. 
the interior surfaces rise to between 35 and 45 degrees C. That's a little bit higher than expected. If we look at the heat embedded in the movement of air between the machine and the room, we get mm, roughly 500 watts of gain into the room and about 700 watts of a cooling to the machine. Is this what we expected to see? Well, none of the numbers is wildly impossible. And it's also true that the simulation didn't blow up while it was generating these numbers, but that doesn't prove that this digital twin is ready for prime time. The next video in the series will look at the model for errors and emissions. They might still be there, and it will drill down into the performance data to see which patterns match expectations and try to identify aspects that need adjustment in order to better fit observations.